welcome Father William on uh, his talk on the Feast of St. Bernard. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, the, the Feast of St. Bernard of Clairvaux uh, is, uh, uh, St. Bernard is not tremendously popular today. Uh, not unexpected, uh, but in the Cistercian order, um, he's considered one of our greatest uh, mystics and one of our greatest writers, one of our greatest saints. And uh, he's kind of like the second founder uh, of the Cistercian order. Uh, he comes from a, uh, a noble family in, uh, in France. Uh, uh, I forget, he had, there was a, a large number of, of uh, siblings, brothers and sisters, and a number of them actually became monks and nuns uh, due to the influence of St. Bernard. Um, in the, uh, he, he dates roughly, it's easy to remember, the first half uh, of the uh, 12th century, instead of giving specific dates, you know. But the first half of the 12th century, uh, that was a, a time of uh, uh, a great, great fervor uh, in terms of prayer and, and uh, mystical or contemplative prayer. And uh, in Europe, in the 12th century, St. Bernard was perhaps the, uh, the greatest uh, personage of that time in that place. Um, he was known all over Europe. And um, uh, he, uh, when he joined the monastery in, uh, uh, in Citeaux, uh, the monastery was floundering. It had just been founded. Uh, actually, we speak of the, our three holy founders, Robert, Stephen, and Alberic. But uh, and, and 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 it was a, they were getting no vocations. Uh, the life was extremely austere. Uh, the uh, they were very very poor. Uh, they said they were they were living off of the leaves from certain trees and and uh, uh, conditions were very bad. And then uh, uh, you might say all of a sudden, uh, somebody knocks at the door and it's St. Bernard now, he's just 21 years old and he's got 30 people with him, 30 potential novices. Um, and uh, they say that uh, he, uh, he, he actually wanted to enter when he was 15, but they wouldn't let him because he was too young. So uh, what he did was he went around to the villages uh, in his father's, um, as they call it, his, um, uh, um, I, I forget the word, where he was the, uh, uh, the feudal lord. And uh, he, would, he would enlist people to come with him to the monastery. And he was not very particular. Uh, he didn't care if they were married or or uh, uh, whatever their situation was, he just dragged them along. And they say that when he would come to one of the villages in his father's feudal domain, the women used to lock their husbands in the cellar, lest St. Bernard come and take them along to become monks. But anyway, uh, he did bring 30 monks with him and he revitalized the monastery of Citeaux. Um, he was a novice there for two, just two years, and uh, he was so noted for his sanctity and his wisdom that, that after only two years, they sent him to Clairvaux to uh, uh, found yet another monastery. And uh, within his lifetime, he founded either directly or indirectly, I think it was over 200 monasteries. Uh, now, he, they weren't all started from scratch. Many of them had belonged to the Benedictine order, but they came over and joined the Cistercian order. Um, he also was um, uh, noted for, this was perhaps unfortunate, but uh, St. Bernard uh, preached, uh, he was asked uh, to preach a crusade and literally a crusade. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a group of, of, of thousands of people who would travel to uh, the Holy Land and who would 
uh, fight and to try to uh, live, it's probably not the best word, a politically correct word, but to liberate the holy places from Muslim control so that Christians could uh, go and worship in the, in the holy places. And uh, there was, the first crusade was quite successful. Uh, the second one preached by St. Bernard was not successful. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they became just nothing but a bunch of brigands and thieves. And, and uh, they, as they traveled from Europe to overland uh, to uh, uh, the Near East, the Middle East, uh, they pillaged and robbed and they got to Constantinople, which, which was a Christian city, and they pillaged Constantinople and, 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 and they, to such an extent that to this day in Constantinople, um, in Istanbul, which is the present Constantinople, the, the mothers frightened their children with stories of the Second Crusade. So, and, and crusade is not a happy word there, um, as it is not, of course, among any of the uh, Muslim population. So, but uh, that was a mistake that Bernard made. Uh, and yet he was so eloquent in his preaching that he got thousands of um, volunteers of people to go. Um, and and, uh, and when, when Bernard saw the uh, results of that crusade, he, he made a vow to himself that he would never leave the monastery again, and that he had no business uh, doing that sort of thing. So anyway, but uh, when, when Bernard uh, was uh, the abbot of, uh, of Clairvaux, his, um, they had what they called the Avignon Captivity. And, and uh, uh, this was really a, a political battle of the French against the Italian. Now, uh, the Bishop of Rome was considered the Pope. Whoever was the Bishop of Rome was the Pope of the Catholic Church. So uh, because of its geographical location, as you can imagine, the bishops of Rome, or by and large, were Italian. And so uh, this gave the, uh, because he had considerable power and wealth and property, and, and, uh, and actually the, the papal domain was actually a country in itself. Uh, so uh, it, the, the Italy was able to, to dominate the church and indeed the uh, uh, Western Europe. So the, uh, they had a, uh, 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 however, in, uh, they, they had what they called the uh, Avignon Captivity. And this was a, it was a political thing in which the, the French domain had gotten together enough cardinals to have an election and they elected a, a pope uh, but he, he was going to reign not in, uh, in Rome, but in Avignon, which was a large city in the French domain. And so if the Pope then uh, were the, the, uh, the Bishop of Rome, yes, but his seat of, of residence was Avignon. So therefore the uh, political power and the ecclesial power uh, which was perhaps sometimes even greater than the uh, civil political power, uh, would be centered uh, under French control. So there you had two popes, uh, one of them Italian uh, in Rome, and another one uh, French in Avignon. Uh, and actually, as a matter of fact, there was even a third somewhere, but he died along the way. But they finally, wanted, they knew they couldn't, have a situation like that with two popes. So what they did was they called St. Bernard in and, 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 and asked him to choose. So he was actually, you know, they talk about king makers. Uh, he was a king maker and he was a pope maker. So he was, was a man of great authority and, and great respect and great power. He also, his writings were truly marvelous, um, especially some of his commentaries on the Song of Songs, 
which are still read today as, as great mystical and, and spiritual works. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, uh, uh, his brother, uh, who was his, you might say his right hand man, he, he was the seller, or he was in charge of the materialities of Bernard's monasteries, uh, so, which would allow Bernard to be free to be more concerned with the spirituality of the monastery. And when his brother died, uh, Bernard wrote a beautiful uh, sermon, which is well, well known today, uh, on the death of his brother. Um, so uh, Bernard then was, he was very, very well known for what he did in the past. But what, what I would like to do today, though, on, on this Feast of Bernard, we, we've all heard, especially we monks, uh, uh, we Cistercian monks, you know, we've been listening to the deeds of, of Bernard of Clairvaux for 900 years. We're tired of it. Uh, ah. I think that uh, uh, we, what we want to do is, is there some other way that we can see Bernard and not by looking into the past. What I would like to do is I would look, I would like to look into the pre present and see what Bernard means, uh, well, to Cistercian monks, but if he, he, he can mean the same thing to all of us. He is, he's a saint, a universal saint. He is by no means limited to, to monks or Cistercian monks. Well, you know, um, uh, in the, uh, uh, when we celebrate the Eucharist, uh, there's, a, there's a prayer. Most of you will know of this prayer. Uh, uh, it's called the preface. And uh, it's, it, it occurs after the offering of the gifts of the bread and wine and before the consecration uh, of the gift, the blessings, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the gifts. It's in between the two of them. Now, for, for many years, uh, that's how I used to see it. I used to say, well, you know, the, okay, there's the offertory, and I join in on that, offer myself with the, with the bread and wine and so forth, and then sit and wait until the preface is over, and, and then the preface ends with, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. And then would be followed by the consecration. So the preface was just something you kind of sat through, you know, and, and then when it was over, you, you got back into the important part of the Mass. But it's only in the past few years that the Holy Spirit has, has given me a sufficient wisdom to be able to see, uh, uh, at, at least from a Catholic, not, not only a Catholic, a Christian point of view, um, uh, that in, in the preface, there is something marvelous that happens or that is talked about. Uh, the preface starts with the, the priest says, the Lord be with you. And the, we respond, and with your spirit. Uh, and then the, the priest says, lift up your hearts. Uh, and the response is, we lift them up to the Lord. This is an invitation to contemplation. He doesn't say, lift up your minds or your thoughts. What he says is, lift up your hearts. And the heart is the domain of the contemplative. The heart is the, the source, the origin of love. Uh, the heart is the will choosing to love God and to love neighbor. So lift up your heart. And the response is, we lift them up to the Lord. And then uh, uh, the, the priest says, uh, uh, then he says, um, it is right and just. He says, so it, it, now there's, there's about 15 different prefaces, but they all follow a certain form, okay? So he says, it is right and just that always and in all places, you know, that we lift our hearts up to the Lord. And then depending on the saint who is being uh, honored or the feast day like Christmas or Easter or Pentecost, uh, the priest will bring into the preface some mention of that saint 
or of that feast day. Uh, and so uh, this is a way of bringing us into the contemplative dimension in accordance with the season of the year or the festival of the saint we're celebrating. And so he will say something like, uh, now I, I'm just, I don't remember what the exact words were that we use today, but it was, it, it is right and just and, and profitable for our salvation that everywhere and always we give praise to God and we praise you, Lord, especially on this festival of your holy confessor, uh, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, and then we say, and then what we do is we, we mention a, one or two things about him. Uh, and then the, all of the prefaces, and this is the thing I really want to stress. All of the prefaces end in the same way, but in different words. Uh, and, and how they end is, they say, and so we join together with all the saints and angels. We join together with the seraphim and the cherubim, with the powers, the thrones, the dominions. We join together with the holy martyrs. We join together with, with uh, 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 all of the heavenly choir. Uh, and then it, it says in Latin, sine fine, without end, never ending, constantly. Sine fine, dicentes, singing or acclaiming without end the words of the holy choirs of heaven. And then we do holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. This is abs this is absolutely astounding. Uh, what, what happens here is, is we enter totally and completely into the contemplative dimension. We, and let me see, I'm using now, I'm borrowing now from the, the image and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the language and the imagery uh, of the book of Revelation, uh, that we're joining in the heavenly court. And, and so uh, when, this, when we say this, we're bowing down with the, with the, uh, the 24 elders. Uh, uh, we're proclaiming uh, the name of God uh, with, the, uh, with the four living creatures. We're chanting out with every angel and archangel and the myriads of them. Each one has his own voice, his own, if you will, each angel. And we we're told there are countless angels. We just don't know that they are not numbered. Uh, but every one of them has his own voice, you might say, uh, his own charism, uh, uh, and as each one of them is acclaiming in his own way the, the holiness and the beauty of God as he manifests himself in the heavens and on the earth. And, and, and uh, the, in the, he does this by the power and the love of the Holy Spirit who takes these acclamations and, and by the love which the Holy Spirit is, he blends them into a, a, a harmonious chorus singing the glories of God. The, but this chorus, and this is the wonderful thing, this chorus is made up of multiple different voices singing the praises of God each according to his own charism. And uh, uh, so, and, and on, on the Feast of Bernard of Clairvaux, what, what I like or what we do is we take the charism of Bernard and we sort of uh, give it a place of honor uh, over or, or together and over with all of the other uh, uh, charisms and all of the other, um, um, what's the word? I'm, it doesn't matter. Uh, all of the other uh, uh, um, charisms that 
each of the saints and angels sings the glory of God. And, uh, and I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a secret, though. Um, uh, Bernard, you hear Bernard, you can listen today. And I, that's what I want you to do tonight. Listen to Bernard's song. Listen to Bernard's chanting. Listen to Bernard's praising of God. And I'll tell you a secret. I'm going to give you his own charism. Uh, this is what Bernard is saying. Bernard is saying, the measure of love is to love without measure. And he's standing before the throne of the Most High God, bowing down and chanting his, his uh, charism. And, and, and you know what? I'll tell you a secret. Bernard, um, I would be willing to swear, Bernard's an Irish tenor. Uh, he, uh, uh, he sings with the, with the beauty of, 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 uh, of one of the Irish tenors. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, and, and this is the tribute. Now, today we join with him uh, on this. And this is Bernard speaking today. This is not so much uh, a Bernard that we look on in the past as a, a great man of the 12th century, you know, as a Pope maker, uh, as a founder of, of large monasteries, even as a, a writer of, of beautiful, spiritual, mystical uh, uh, works. Uh, this is Bernard of today, and this is what Bernard is doing today. And this is something that we can join in with Bernard chanting together with him his praises of God. And those praises in, in, in Bernard's words are, the measure of love is to love without measure. Hmm. Well, that's it for me. Uh, Thank you so much. Father William, thank you so much. And I actually have, I'm waiting on, while we're waiting on a couple of questions, if anybody has a question to ask, I have a couple myself. And first of all, thank you so much for explaining that uh, on the preface, because, because as somebody who methodically tries to follow the mass, the, the delta between the preface and the Eucharistic prayer is something that you can't always follow and I've always wondered, you know, exactly where that is coming from, but I see the connection now. And, and thank you, especially in that regard, for the contemplative language that exists in that. I had never thought of that before, and I, I, never, I never learned that. So thank you. That, is, that, was, uh, that was really enlightening. And my, my other question, Father, is... Um, uh, I appreciate you talking about Sato and, and I'm, I'm fascinated with the history of the Cistercians. I think it's a very interesting history that one of my favorite books is the Merton book, Waters of Silo, which, yes. you know, I sort of approached it kind of like, oh, this is just a history, but it, it's like a mystery novel adventure. Indiana Jones, these guys were crazy brave and what an adventure that was to come to the, to come to this country. But, um, and I guess the, the mother house for the United States was, was I guess, was Melloray originally. But in Sato, that is the original house for the Cistercian order. Yes. Correct? Yes. And are, are, the, are the monks there now, are they Trappists? Can, maybe you can explain to everybody the yes, difference between the Trappists yes. and the Cistercians. Uh, all right. The difference between Trappists and Cistercians. Well, the Cistercians were... A kind of like a reform uh, in, at, in around the year 1098. Now, uh, it wasn't really a reform because uh, if, it's, if, if the order, if it, order is not deformed, it doesn't need to be reformed. Right. Uh, but but the, uh, the type of Benedictine monasteries that were flourishing in Europe uh, and in the, in the Middle East uh, were actually what they call the Cluny monasteries. And um, uh, over the years, what had happened is uh, these monasteries had 
taken on uh, the chanting of the divine office. Uh, you know, they would uh, sing the uh, uh, every in the, in the morning, uh, you know, at, like at three in the morning, then at nine, then at 12, then three in the afternoon, then six in the evening, uh, what they call the, you know, the daily hours. And, and the monks would sing those according to the rule of St. Benedict, who tells us how to do this, you see. He'll say, now every morning you, you do these psalms and then you do these in the afternoon. And then, but, but then he says, um, if this isn't all right for any given individual uh, monastery, let the abbot change it and decide himself what he wants them to do. Well, what happened was, uh, as people got more and more devout, they began to add more and more prayers on to the Psalms that St. Benedict had commanded. And so the offices get, began to get longer and longer and longer until they reached the point uh, in what we call the Cluny monasteries or the Cluny observances. And Cluny was just a place in France uh, where they were chanting the office 24 hours a day. And, and they would, they would uh, you know, take turns in, in going into choir, leaving the choir, another group would come in and, and they would have what they call the, the, the eternal praise. Now this was wonderful and this was good, but St. Robert uh, belonged to uh, a Cluny monastery in uh, uh, in uh, Salem, excuse me, uh, Malem in in France, and he uh, reading the rule, he said, "Well, yes, but this isn't really what the Benedictines are supposed to be. We aren't supposed to be in choir all day singing. What we're supposed to be is uh, alone, apart, in silence, and in contemplative prayer." Uh, and, and, and also, we're supposed to be working outside, working in the fields, uh, and so forth. And the, and the Clooney observances didn't allow for that, because it was so taken up, you see, uh, with this perennial praise. So he went to a Cito, uh, the, the word simply means swamp. He went near the city of Dijon. Uh, with a handful of monks. And uh, their purpose was uh, to uh, live the monastic life more in accordance with the rule of St. Benedict, strictly speaking, you see. So it wasn't a reform in the sense that Cluny was evil or degraded or right. anything. It wasn't like that at all. But anyway, so uh, there you have the Cistercian order. And, and uh, uh, Robert and Stephen and Albrecht were the, the first three abbots, and they're considered the founders. And then in comes uh, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux with his 30 novices. And from there, the, the uh, Cistercian order just spread throughout Europe. Okay, so right now we have Cistercians. We don't have any Trappists, all right? Uh, so as things would happen, uh, we're now in the 18th century, say around, I don't know, the date's around 1750. And the Cistercian order had really fallen uh, uh, into uh, um, a need for reform. Uh, some of the monasteries had one or two monks. Uh, they talk about one of the monasteries in Europe where, where the, the, there was a handful of monks and they were using the cloisters as a bowling alley. Uh, so uh, there was a need for a reform. And so uh, this reform occurred uh, in the monastery of La Trappe, uh, which is a, 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 a Cistercian monastery near Paris. And so uh, th th that reform took hold uh, and, and it just, it, it, it spread itself again throughout Europe and, and so forth. And, and so they were known as Trappists. 
from the monastery, the reform of La Trappe. Now, uh, uh, they uh, followed the rule kind of strictly, perhaps a little more strictly than, than uh, even the rule calls for. Uh, and, and things like, uh, for example, the rule says that monks should not eat the meat of four-footed animals uh, and the fasting and, and, and different things that had fallen into neglect. Well, they, they, at, at, at the Trappist restored them. And other religious orders, seeing the example of the Trappist, kind of used them as models for their own rules and, and their own ways of life. And so the, the uh, Trappist order then uh, became very strong and very powerful. Uh, and, and then uh, at, after World War II, especially in the United States, it just grew uh, um, like, you know, uh, the... Uh, some of our, our, our say Spencer here, the monastery where I am now, uh, there was something like 250 monks. We now have 50 monks, which is, by the way, uh, big. That's a lot. Yeah. The, the order calls for monks, not monasteries, not to be more than 50 monks. Wow. Um, but we, we, would, we don't have that more anyway, although we do have uh, four novices waiting to enter. Uh, but the, uh, uh, so, the, so that, that some monks, though, especially in Germany and Switzerland, uh, they did not join the Trappist observances, uh, but they also got away from the excesses of the Cluny observances, and they called themselves the Order of Citeaux. So you have the, the Order of Citeaux, and then you have the Trappists, who call themselves the order of Cistercians of the strict observance. So you've got two orders, you see, following the same rule, uh, and, but with their own particular charism. Now we have in the United States, uh, I think we have two monasteries of women that are Cistercians of the order of Cito, and we have about 10 that are Trappistines. Uh, and we have maybe, I'm not sure the number of maybe 12 Trappist monasteries of men, and we have two of the uh, uh, Cistercian, the Order of Citeaux. So if, can, is that, I hope that's clear. It's, oh, that was very thorough. No, uh, that was great. I was curious if there were any non-Trappist Cistercian monasteries in the United States. Yes. And, and the, the answer is uh, there are, yeah. Yeah, in Austin, uh, is it in Austin, Texas? There's a monastery there, uh, and they they have a um, a, a a college, a university oh, that they cool. teach in. But see, Trappists won't do that. Right. Okay, I have a couple I others. Have a Let's. For you. Will you, Father William? Yeah. Um, did you ever meet Jean Leclerc? Jean Leclerc. Oh, sure, I knew him well. Tell tell me about John the Clerk and his connection oh. with Saint Bernard. Great question. Well, John the Clerk was he was considered to be the uh, the, the greatest authority on Saint Bernard, uh, but he taught at the um, uh, was it at the uh, at the Gregorian in Rome, uh, and uh, um, uh, he wrote several books on uh, 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 early sister early. Uh, monastic life, um, and um, he also visited um, uh, the United States, and I took him around to different uh, uh, Benedictine monasteries and Trappist monasteries. Um, he was not a Trappist, but his monastery was in uh, from Belgium, uh, and uh, but he, he spent all of his time actually in Rome. Um, I, I really can't you know, uh, uh, cool. thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, another question here and this is, I've got a couple more. If you've got a few more minutes, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Maggie asks, do you recommend any good sources for St. Bernard, St. Bernard's writings? Well, yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the one that, um, uh, it has been difficult. It's only the in the past oh, 30, 40 years, 
and mostly due to Father Basil Pennington, uh, that we have an English translation uh, of St. Bernard, and particularly, uh, and I think you can get it on the web. Uh, I know I listened to it on, um, oh yeah, through the um, uh, Wheaton University in, in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, they, they have the Fathers of the Church series, and I think you can get uh, Bernard's commentary on the Song of Songs. Um, it, it's not a work to be brushed off easily or to be just quickly read and say, well, now I've read that. Uh, it's a work to use seriously uh, in Lexio Divina, uh, but it's, it's absolutely a truly marvelous uh, uh, thing to read. So that's also available. Uh, I think it's available under the and the Paulus series of Western spirituality. Um, so th that I would, I would recommend above all. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Megan asked when a living, when with like, for example, with uh, St. Bernard being deemed a kingmaker in terms of with the, the papal issues that he was dealing with, do you have any sense of how he remained humble did he struggle with that? <laughs> All I can say is he's a canonized saint, so he must yeah. have succeeded. <laughs> uh, I'm sure he had to struggle with that. I, I think that uh, even an abbot, you know, has to struggle get, considering the, the, you know, the vow of obedience, which is given to the abbot, you know. It's not given to the order or to the church. It's given to the abbot. Uh, and, and the Benedictines also do this. Uh, so uh, I'm sure that uh, that is a, uh, a constant temptation. <laughs> sure. Um, one more. Um, Rowan asks, how is the Carthusian order related? Well, the Carthusian order also follows the rule of St. Benedict um, in so far as that is compatible with their charism of solitude. That's about as much as I dare to say on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good answer. Uh, that's it. That's all right. That's kind of what we have for Father William. Thank you so much, man. That was just, I mean, there's so many thank yous coming through in the chats. Thank you for the time. Thank you for, so thank well, you very, very much for this. Okay. Dan? I will sign off now. Thanks, Father William. Yep. God bless you.